Welcome to the second China bi-weekly seminar on public economics. Uh, I'm the host of today's talk. Uh, my name is Li Xingli from Peking University. So let me first make a brief introduction to the speaker, Professor Joe Snamroy. Uh, he is the Paul McCracken Collegiate Professor of Business Economics and Public Policy at the School of Business at the University of Michigan. He is also affiliated with the Department of Economics and also serves as Director of the Office of Tax Policy Research. Professor Slamrod has been a consultant to the U.S. Department of the Treasury and to the government of a few other countries and international organizations. Professor Slamrod has been the editor of the National Tax Journal from 1992 to 1998 and the co-editor of the Journal of Public Economics from 2006 to 2010. Professor Snamrod has authored numerous journal articles and books and received numerous awards. For Chinese scholars, I think maybe he is most well known for his serious research on tax compliance and enforcement, which is really a hot topic uh, for Chinese scholars. But he's also working on a few other uh, very exciting areas. So now let's uh, give the floor to Professor Slamrod. Uh, well, he, he is going to talk about the optimal multi-regime tax system uh, today. So for audience, uh, please leave your questions on the chat box. Uh, and uh, uh, if you want to ask questions uh, directly, please raise your hand. We will have 10, 20 minutes at the end uh, to have Q&A sessions. Okay, Professor Snamrod, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you um, very much for that introduction. By the way, the kids you hear are not mine, it's somebody else's. Um, uh, I, actually, the topic for today isn't um, optimal multi-regime taxes. That was the original plan, but um, had, uh, I've changed uh, the topic and instead today I'm going to do something a little bit different from the usual seminar presentation. I'm going to talk about a book that uh, I've written with uh, Michael Keane um, at the IMF, which is uh, going to be pr uh, uh, published by Princeton University Press uh, next April. Um, and it's called Tax Follies and Wisdom Through the Ages. Okay, but my, um, my screen is not allowing me to change the slide. Hmm. Uh, we can see it clearly. Uh, yes, I, I can see it clearly too, but the problem is I can't switch the slide. So let me go out, see why that's happening. All right. Oh, uh, wait. Okay. okay, I just got it. I don't know what happened. All right, so I'm going to talk about the, uh, this new book, uh, Tax Policy and Wisdom Through the Ages. Before I get into it, let me say that um, my co-author is from the IMF, and so I need to say that the views that I discussed today are not necessarily shared by the IMF. And in fact, um, they're not necessarily shared by my co-author, but my co-author is in on the Zoom call. So if I say something um, completely egregious, I invite uh, him to chime in. Okay, um, so uh, why did we write this book? And what is this book about? Well, uh, many of you on the call probably uh, teach taxation and you also do research about taxation. And you might have uh, learned that not everybody thinks taxation is a particularly exciting subject. And so one of the aims of this book is to make taxation and the issues that we uh, investigate in our research lives uh, interesting and make them come alive. The book uses historical episodes from ancient times to current times to illustrate the basic principles of taxation. 
I will try to convince you when I talk about taxes that have been levied in the past that some of those taxes, which on first blush might seem at a minimum quaint and maybe even stupid, often were quite smart given the circumstances and the, certainly the environment that tax policy was made in the past was quite different than now. The information available to the government was different. The compliance tools available were different. The economy was very different. And so we'll try to look through to see why in those different environments, uh, different tax policies might have made sense. And as I said, one of the goals is try to, to attract readers who might be put off by taxation and think it's dry. Uh, we're hoping that the book will be adopted as a supplementary text in uh, classes of taxation in economics departments, in accounting, de accounting departments, in law schools, um, as, a, as a more exciting, uh, accessible way to learn about taxation. It will uh, be released next April. So we're getting close, six months away. By a, It'll be published by Princeton University Press. So what I wanna do uh, tonight and uh, this morning for you in China is to pick out several episodes to illustrate uh, the approach that the book takes. And um, I've saved the last few episodes, um, uh, which are about China. Okay. So uh, we understand that tax uh, doesn't explain everything that has ever happened in history, but we're gonna, we argue in the book, it explains a lot. And uh, one of the um, attractions of the book is we have a lot of uh, interesting pictures, uh, which I'll show several of them to you um, as I go along. Um, and uh, here are the first two. So um, the picture on the left is of a battle, that's obvious. It's the Battle of Arica. The Battle of Arica happened in what is known as the Ten Cents War. The Ten Cents War was a war between Chile on one side and on the other side, Bolivia and Peru uh, over a hundred years ago. What was happening was that Chile was uh, Chilean investors, once uh, the northern uh, border of Chile, which was then Peru and Bolivia, became a, a valuable economic zone. Chilean investors started to come in, and uh, there was a dispute about uh, who was going to, which countries were going to get the benefit of the uh, economic resources in this area. And finally, uh, Chile and Peru had an agreement, which we today we would call a fiscal stability clause. Uh, Peru agreed not to raise taxes on the Chilean mining operations for at least 25 years. But then a few years later, they imposed a uh, 10 centavos tax uh, and Chile took this to mean a violation of the fiscal stability clause and a war ensued. It was known as the 10 cents war. And the Chile won. This was uh, one of the key battles in the war where the uh, general uh, on the Peruvian side was killed. He's in the middle of this picture. On the right side of this slide is a um, illustration of a very important moment in United States history at the beginning of the formation of the country. This is a, a rendering of the Boston Tea Party, which uh, holds an important place in the origin story of the United States. And we say in the book that it's largely misunderstood. It wasn't a, a tax increase that led to the Boston Tea Party. It was actually a tax cut with some in, uh, changes in enforcement. And the, the tax cut actually began with the British tax problems in India. India was not producing the tax revenue that had been expected, which led to the British needing more revenue, dot, 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 and we had the Boston Tea Party. So I want to uh, talk about some, begin with some tax episodes that might at first seem strange but actually um, have a very uh, reasonable explanation and actually can uh, shed light on tax policy of today. And the first one I wanna talk about is the window tax in England. This is a tax that lasted over 150 years from 1696 
1851. England levied a tax on dwellings based on the number of windows. Why? Why would you base a tax on the number of windows? Did they have something against uh, well-lit rooms or good hygiene? Well, of course, it was neither of those things. What it was is that the English government wanted to levy a tax that was larger, the more valuable, the more impressive, the more valuable was the house. And uh, there was no internet site they could go to that would estimate the value of the house. Um, what is something that was easily uh, uh, observable and verifiable that uh, wouldn't require a whole lot of enforcement resources? And the answer they hit upon was the value of houses. I'm sorry, was the number of windows. Certainly it's true that that's correlated with the value of the house. Small houses might have one window fabulous houses might have 20 or 30. Uh, they had first, uh, before the window tax, tried another uh, observable aspect of a house that's related to house value, the number of fireplaces. The problem with that one is that to, to verify the number of uh, fireplaces, the uh, tax inspector had to get inside the house. It's uh, understandably a lot of um, homeowners didn't like. Well, for, uh, to count the number of windows, you don't have to get inside the house. So what happened? Um, and why? what is the lesson from the window tax? Well, for, uh, one lesson is that in most cases, tax liability must be based on a measurable and verifiable base. And that is important in the history of tax because what can be measured and what can be verified varies over time. Uh, in 1696, windows were an easily verifiable uh, correlate with the value of a house. Now we can do better. A second lesson is that no matter what the tax is, taxpayers will seek ways to reduce tax liability, both legal and illegal. And uh, in our book, we have many, many stories about ingenious uh, ways that taxpayers tried to reduce their tax liability. The most famous response to window taxes in England was to just brick up your windows and uh, therefore reduce the number of windows and reduce your tax liability. And here's a picture of a building in England. This is not a picture from uh, 400 years, uh, 300 years ago. This is a current building, but it still shows the sign signs of tax avoidance because we see bricked up windows. For those of you who are using modern empirical techniques, you will be interested to know that the window tax in England 300 years ago was at what we call today a notch, meaning that the tax liability was the same for a building that had between one and nine windows, but as soon as you got to 10, the tax liability jumped discreetly by quite a bit and stayed up until you got to another number of windows. And historical records from that period show that sure enough, as we have learned in the last few years, whenever there are notches, there is bunching. And there are a lot more buildings in England from that period that had exactly nine windows than you would otherwise think because these the owners of these buildings were doing their best to stay under the tax notch and lower their tax liability. Well, uh, another thing that is no different now than 300 some years ago is that uh, there was a back and forth between taxpayers and the tax authority. For example, what exactly is a window? So one thing uh, some English homeowners did is they would put windows in the corners of two rooms. So you'd have one window but it would allow light to come into two rooms. Well, there's a tax reducing strategy that seems like a winner. Um, that worked for a while until um, in 1747, the English said that windows lighting more than one room were to be charged per room rather than per window. And the same kind of thing, of course, goes on now between the taxpayers and the tax authority. 
Next example is uh, about uh, also about houses, but it's not about how many windows they had. It's about what they look like. Um, in 400 years ago, Poland and Holland both levied a property tax. Again, not based on the value of the house as property taxes are now, but based on something that was easier to measure. And what they chose was how wide was the house facing the street, the street facing facade. And so what was the taxpayer's response? Well, if you want to minimize your tax for a given square footage or, uh, of a house, you want what's facing the street to be very narrow. And sure enough, in Poland and Holland, very, very narrow houses were constructed. And even in Vietnam, till to this day, houses and shops have been constructed to minimize tax under a, same, a similar property tax system. And in Vietnam, these are known as tube houses or rocket houses. Why? Because they look like this. You can see that the, uh, the uh, what's facing the street is very, very narrow. And so it minimizes property taxes, even though the square footage in these buildings could be very, very large. So this is a visible example of a, of a government trying to have a tax system which did not rely on a lot of information that was hard to get, such as the value of the house, and how the taxpayers reacted to that system. Those of us who teach tax have to explain to our students the idea of excess burden, which is the economic cost incurred when taxpayers change their behavior in response to taxes. We talk about labor supply being lower because of taxes. We talk about investment being lower, and that's excess burden. And in our book and the slides I've showed you, these are visible examples of excess burden houses that are skinnier than they otherwise would be, windows that would never be bricked up if it weren't for this tax system. An excess burden, I think we've all learned, is a difficult concept to convey because what it requires is knowing what people and businesses would have done if it wasn't for taxes. If we're thinking about labor supply, to understand the excess burden due to reduced labor supply, we need to know how much labor people would have supplied if it weren't for taxes. And we don't ever observe that. We have to use uh, uh, econometric methods to try to estimate that. And the reason these pictures are helpful is that we have a good sense of what houses should look like. And so we see the houses with the bricked up windows we see the skinny houses and we can get a visible, a visual sense of how taxation distorts decisions. So when we teach excess burden, we put up diagrams like this. Uh, there's a triangle uh, in between the pre-tax supply curve and the demand curve and the area of that triangle, Harberger taught us uh, more than 60 years ago, is a approximation of the excess burden, the loss in uh, the value of output because people change their behavior. That those um, a D plus E on this diagram is excess burden. And some of you might have seen your students' eyes glaze over when this diagram goes up. So what I want you to do as you're thinking about thinking about teaching excess burden is to compare this diagram to this, and I'll explain what, why this is excess burden in a second. This is a visual illustration of excess burden, this dog. So I say, except for PhD students, the excess burden diagram is not an easy concept to convey, but the pictures convey the point of excess burden. But why the picture of this dog? Well, time for another story. The story is in the 17th century, again, the British are the uh, agents here. They levied a tax on dogs. Why? They were worried that the dogs of peasants were poaching on the royal game. They were bothering the deer that the royals wanted to keep for their own hunting. 
So there was a tax on dogs, but there was a uh, the dogs without tails were exempt from the tax. Why? Because the reasoning was that dogs without tails just wouldn't be good hunting dogs. It, without tails, they wouldn't have the balance and mobility. So there was a tax on dogs for that reason. Dogs without tails were exempt. What happened? Peasants started to cut their dogs' tails to save on tax. They understood that maybe the dogs without tails wouldn't be great hunters, that they would be good enough hunters to save tax and to cut the tail. One result of this is by the time the tax was repealed, people were used to certain dogs looking a certain way without tax. And even today, old English sheepdogs and Doberman pinchers are commonly bobtailed, meaning their tails are cut. So the picture of a dog without a tail is an illustration of excess burden. It's a, vis a visual picture because we know what a dog is supposed to look like if it weren't for tax avoidance. It should have a tail. Okay, so excess burden is an, is an unwanted side effect of taxation. We want, the government wants to raise revenue, but a side effect is that taxpayers will change their behavior and that has an efficiency cost. Sometimes though, the tax is put in place purposely to change behavior. And I'll start with a, a quaint old example of this, and then I'll move to talking about an important current example of taxes uh, that are in place purposely to change behavior. So this is about taxing beards. Um, in 1698 in Russia, the emperor Peter the Great decided he wanted to westernize Russia. He wanted to emulate France and Britain and Germany, the Western European countries. And he noticed that one difference between those countries was at that time, uh, the, uh, the elite in England and France and Germany uh, did not have beards, but his nobility did. So he wanted to make Russia look more like Western Europe. What did he do? He put a tax on beards. This was an annual tax on beards, not because it was designed to raise a lot of revenue. It was designed to get the nobility to shave their beards and maybe to humiliate those who chose not to shave. So in Russia at that time, if you were on the street and you had a beard, you had to wear a beard token. And that beard token you got only if you paid your tax. So if you were on the street in Moscow in 1699 and you had a beard, you had to have the beard token. And on one side of the token, it said in Russian, of course, the beard is a superfluous burden. And that is danger. That language is so close to excess burden that it's wonderful. And on the other side of the token was this. This is what it looked like. And it said, I've paid my beard tax. So the beard tax is a, and you can see there's a, sort of a caricature of a beard and a mustache and even a nose on this token. So what's the lesson? The lesson is often it is the objective of the tax to change behavior, sometimes with a sinister purpose, sometimes with a laudable purpose. And uh, our book has some fascinating examples of taxes designed not necessarily to raise revenue, that might have been a second order objective, but to change uh, behavior. Some of the examples are of governments that wanted to uh, reduce people's belief in a disfavored religion. So there would be a tax on people who professed and followed the disfavored religion. Of course, if verifiability is important to a tax, how do you verify a belief? You can ask somebody what they believe, but they can say whatever they want. How do you verify it? Another uh, tax in history with the objective of changing behavior is called ta a tax on knowledge. Well, it wasn't literally, of course, a tax on knowledge. It was a tax on newspapers. And some governments in 18th and 19th century England did this 
not necessarily to raise revenue, but to suppress the free flow of information in the country at that time. And the last example is taxes on smoking, uh, which are uh, these days explicitly justified as a way to reduce smoking and the health costs that um, come from smoking. Now, I said that later in the talk, I would uh, bring up some examples from the book coming from China, but one uh, 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 is uh, relevant now. It's a story about how in Hubei province in 2009, the taxation of uh, cigarettes, uh, the revenue was so important to the province that they needed people to buy cigarettes, uh, even though in principle, the tax was there to reduce smoking. Suddenly the government needed revenue and in Hubei in 2009, uh, citizens were given smoking quotas. Uh, so the revenue um, from uh, taxing cigarettes would stay up. And by the way, those of you who know about history of taxation in China, when I talk about Chinese taxes, if I say something wrong, please make, it, make a note and come back and tell me. Or if you know of fascinating examples in Chinese history that I don't get to, Mick and I would love to hear what you know. Uh, another uh, a fascinating example of uh, taxes designed to change behavior are taxes on bachelors. Uh, they date back to ancient Greece and Rome, and they existed until the 20th century. These are taxes on unmarried men over a certain age. Why would a country do this? Well, you can think it might have been an equity reason. These bachelors don't have a family to support, so maybe their sacrifice from a tax is not so great. Or it might have been, as I was just talking about, explicitly to change behavior to encourage marriage. And here again, uh, no matter what the purpose of the tax is, the responses the taxpayers had are often the most fascinating. Uh, in some countries that had a bachelor tax, a bachelor could avoid the tax if he could prove that he tried to get married, he'd ask the woman to marry him, and he'd been rejected. So it's no fault of his own that he's still a bachelor. This provision was in place in some of the countries that had bachelor taxes. And what that gave rise to was a profession called a professional lady rejector. These aren't people who rejected ladies. These were ladies whose profession were to reject men. So if I wanted to remain a bachelor, but I didn't want to uh, owe the tax, I would go to this woman and I would pay her some money. And she would agree to swear that I had asked her to marry me. And she had said no. Uh, so I. Uh, a fascinating example of the kinds of taxpayer avoidance schemes that crop up uh, in taxation. Now, uh, taxes that are purposely designed to change uh, behavior are not always silly, and they're certainly important to this day. Uh, these days, uh, we economists call them uh, Pigouvian taxes, after the British economist uh, Pigou. And we argue that uh, if there is an activity that has some social harm, it is efficient to set a, to put a tax on that activity equal to the marginal social harm. I don't have to tell you that uh, this works because it forces the uh, uh, people subject to the tax to consider the marginal social harm because it's equal to the tax rate. And this argument is prominent in some of the most important economic problems we have today. Uh, pollution, uh, global warming, uh, taxes on carbon fuels, uh, taxes uh, driving and congested roads are examples of Pigouvian taxes, taxes designed to change people's behavior and firms' behavior. And of course, on the other side of taxation, if there are activities that have a social benefit that taxpayer, the uh, person doing the activity would not take into account because it's external to them. Pagu uh, has an argument for subsidizing those kinds of activities, such as research and development and recycling. 
Now, of course, this book um, is designed to uh, get people laughing and thinking at the same time. So I'm going to move from a very serious subject, uh, global warming, to a not so serious one, taxing pets. But before I do, let me stop and see if there are any, are there any questions that people want to raise now. Joe, sure. it seems there's no question at this moment. OK. Well, I'm going to keep going. But for those of you who want to ask questions, uh, just uh, put them on chat, and our moderator will get them to me the next time I stop. OK. Um, so I'm going to talk about a not so important example of a, uh, of a Paguvian tax. And these are uh, taxes on pets. A few years ago, Denmark, or uh, pets and other animals, a few years ago, Denmark proposed a tax on cow flatulence. Uh, if you don't know what the English word flatulence means, it's a good time to Google it, because I'm not going to say exactly what it is right now. But it turns out that a non-trivial amount of uh, emissions that uh, contribute to the greenhouse effect come from animals. So it's actually quite sensible to think about a Paguvian tax on um, cow flatulence. Uh, it didn't, this bill didn't pass. Germany has a dog tax, and actually other countries have dog taxes. And as Pagu would have said uh, to do, they have a higher tax rate on dogs that are deemed to be dangerous. So that's exactly what a Paguvian tax should do. If there's some potential danger from a particular kind of dog, it is efficient to have a tax equal to the marginal social harm. And you can think of other uh, behaviors that have negative externalities that pets do, barking, defecating. Now, one lesson for Paguvian taxes is you uh, ideally you want to put the tax on the activity that causes the externality. If we're talking about a dog, it if the dog is quiet and is careful with where it defecates and it doesn't bite anyone, then there's no negative externality and there's no reason for a Paguvian tax. It is only dogs that do those particular activities that should be those activities should be taxed. The problem in implementation is it's really difficult to measure and monitor what a dog does. So it might be better than nothing to just have a tax on all dogs, even though that is not a well-targeted Paguvian tax. OK, a lot of my research, some of you might know, has been about tax evasion. So I want to talk about some of the things we talk in our book about tax evasion. It turns out. Uh, tax evasion has been around about as long as taxes have been around. We know this because there's a cuneiform tablet from 19th century BC Sumer. So that's 4,000 years ago, where this tablet uh, reports a man was imprisoned for receiving smuggled goods. And that is about the same date we first have evidence, archaeological evidence of taxation. So the progress uh, of taxation and tax evasion have um, come at about the same time. We also know from 2,700 years ago, a papyrus deed, uh, which records that an old man transferred his property to his sons at a nominal, meaning a low price, in order to lower inheritance tax. So 2,700 years ago, people were undertaking the same kinds of schemes to lower their tax liability uh, that they do now. And one other piece of evidence we have from 2,000 years ago plus is a frieze from ancient Egypt that depicts, and I'll show you what it depicts. OK, so this is from 2,700 years ago. You might, it, it takes a few seconds to figure out what's going on here, but we do know what's going on from what was written um, on the freeze. So in the middle uh, sitting is someone who has been uh, convicted of tax evasion. He is tied to a post. And the two men uh, on either side have whips. And uh, because the whips are hard to see, we added the arrows. The arrows are not on the original uh, Egyptian freeze, of course. But uh, the tax evader is being whipped. So we have evidence 
from over 2,000 years ago, not only of tax evasion, but of the punishment for uh, tax evaders who are caught. So um, tax evasion is not generally a subject that makes, that is uh, perfect for the book, because in the book we have a lot of pictures to try to illustrate uh, principles of taxation. But tax evasion itself is generally not visible for obvious reasons, right? If it was so visible, uh, the government could figure it out um, and uh, punish it. And it's certainly not visibly arresting. So, you know, for example, you can't imagine a striking picture that illustrates tax evasion uh, of people who just don't file tax returns. More vivid and more uh, accessible to pictures are the tax enforcement episodes, such as the one I just showed you, the Egyptian tax evader being whipped. So I can tell some stories about um, some unusual enforcement episodes. Uh, so how do we enforce taxes today and how did we enforce taxes 2,000, 3,000 years ago and throughout history? Well, through two ways, sticks, meaning punishments, and much less so, but occasionally carrots, meaning inducements to, um, to tax compliance. And in the uh, book, we talk about a few episodes where the stick part was taken a bit too far. Uh, probably the most drastic episode comes from the 15th century in what is now Romania, when the, uh, the leader known as Vlad the Impaler, for reasons that will become clear in a second. Uh, by the way, Vlad the Impaler was also uh, better, was also known as Dracula. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, know of the movies and books about Dracula, but that's a, actually a different Dracula. But Vlad the Impaler was uh, famous in tax circles because it turns out there was a town in his area, uh, the area that uh, wouldn't pay their taxes. And Vlad uh, brought his men to the town, set it on fire, and impaled many of its inhabitants. And that's how he got his name, as Vlad the Impaler. He got it through uh, maybe overzealous uh, tax enforcement. Now, well, sometimes uh, governments use carrots, that is, incentives to people to pay their taxes. There is an example in South America where uh, people who paid their property taxes on, on time were put in a lottery and if your name was drawn, the town would give you a new sidewalk right in front of your house. Um, in Pakistan in, in the last uh, eight years picked out the 100 taxpayers, uh, meaning the top 100 remitting taxpayers, the most taxes paid in different categories, the top individuals, the top partnerships, the top corporations. And they were given a taxpayer's privileges and honor card. And they were invited to a state dinner every year to honor that they were high taxpayers. Now, of course, they weren't necessarily completely compliant. They could have paid uh, a lot, but should have paid even more. But um, this is what Pakistan did. And if you had this card, you were in, uh, invited to the state dinner, but you were also given benefits such as fast track uh, immigration. And um, one of my students and co-authors is Pakistani. And when he was coming back through Pakistan one uh, time, he uh, took a picture of the special um, uh, row you get if you have one of these cards. I know this is a little hard to see, but um, line 10 here in, Pac in uh, Lahore, Pakistan, is only for people who have a taxpayer's privilege and honor card, which is at most just a couple hundred people uh, in Pakistan, which is why there's nobody on this line when this picture was taken. Now, uh, tax avoidance meaning legal ways to reduce your tax is more photogenic than tax evasion. So I'm going to tell you some more stories of tax avoidance and then show you some pictures. I told you already about the bricked up windows and the skinny houses. Those are examples of changes in house construction to, re to minimize taxes. 
in 16th century Holland, they taxed their ships. Uh, and Holland designed a tax where more or less the tax was based on the area of the main deck. And I'll show you in a second what that did to the design of uh, Dutch ships. In the 18th and 19th century, the British had a tax on glass, but the tax was based on weight. And I will show you in a second what happened. As you would expect, if you base the tax on the weight of the glass, uh, people are going to are going to have the incentive to produce smaller, uh, fancy objects with thin glasses and with thin um, glass, and they became known as excise glasses. Excise meaning an excise tax. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. And when Chile taxed cars at a much higher rate than panel trucks, what happened was soon the market offered a redesigned panel truck. So it was still mostly like a panel truck to get the lower tax, but it had glass windows instead of panels and upholstered seats in the back. So it was a lot like a car. You might be thinking, well, a panel truck with glass with windows is hardly a panel truck. But this is an example of the back and forth between taxpayers and the tax authorities. So. Um, so let me show you the pictures. So this is a, a tax efficient ship. This is a Dutch ship called the Floyd that was uh, produced in the uh, era where the tax was on ships was based on the, the area of the top deck. And you can see that this ship is pretty narrow on the top deck and actually gets wider below where the cargo is. So this ship was a response, in part, the ship design was a response to the tax because it, it minimized the tax due relative to the amount of cargo it could carry. It also happened to make the ship very seaworthy. And in the book, we tell the story of the British who had a different kind of tax. Um, so it was based on different dimensions of the ship. And the, the tax avoiding response to the British tax actually made the ship less seaworthy. And there are stories of ships sinking um, because in the quest to make the ship owe less tax, it made the ship prone to sinking. This was certainly an example of a large excess burden. And this is a, a, a picture of an excise glass um, so remember, the tax was based on weight. So this is a hollow stem, very thin um, uh, glass, um, which became known as an excise glass because it was a response to the excise tax in part. The last picture I, I'm going to show you, it was um, uh, a, a response to a tax on tobacco that was based not on weight, but on the number of the uh, items, so the number of cigarettes or the number of cigars, that's a, was a tax based on this. This is a tax that was uh, very common in Eastern Europe. Oh, I, I, I'll come do the cigars and then I'll come back and show you that one. Well, what happened? Um, so what uh, the market produced cigars that were very big, but they were taxed per cigar. So the tax wasn't very high and people bought these cigars, not the smoke as they were produced, but they would just chop them up into the tobacco and then re-roll them into cigarettes. So the tax per unit of tobacco was a lot less. Now I'm going to be honest and say that this picture that you're looking at is not actually an example of this kind of cigar, which was known as a party cigar. They were big, but they weren't this big. I, I honestly don't know what these huge cigars were. Um, so uh, my last example of this is um, a picture taken uh, in uh, England. And you can see that on, uh, on the vertical uh, line near the left of this picture, to the left of it, the bricks are bigger. And to the right, the bricks are smaller. Maybe by now you can already guess the story I'm going to tell. But the story is told. I wasn't there, so I'm not a, I can't verify this. 
that um, the bricks on the right were uh, from an old, uh, put up in an older time. And then at some point, the British introduced a tax per brick, not based on weight, but per brick. Well, what is the obvious um, optimal response of taxpayers? Well, just like the optimal response to a, a tax on tobacco based on the number of cigars or cigarettes was to produce very big cigars, the response here was to produce very big bricks. So the story is that the, the construction to the left of that vertical line, uh, those were bricks uh, put there in the era of the high brick tax. So that, that reduced the, the tax per area that the bricks covered. So these um, are all examples you can use your, uh, with your students or to convince your friends at cocktail parties about how taxes affect the behavior. And they're all examples of what I call line drawing. The, uh, line drawing is that uh, often when goods and transactions are taxed, the law has to make a distinction uh, between which ones are taxed higher than others based on the characteristics of the taxed good. And when you do that, um, it creates the incentive to change the characteristics of the taxed item. In fact, it creates an incentive to minimally alter the characteristics to qualify for the lower tax rate. And that's because whenever there's a line where on one side of the line, where the line is in characteristics state, on one side, of the line, there's a high tax. And on the other side, there's a lower tax. There's an incentive to change the characteristics of the tax good to just get onto the low tax side. So it's like a notch, but a notch in characteristics space. So in the book, we talk about a, um, a number of examples of the taxpayer response to uh, taxes based on characteristics. I'll just mention them quickly. In Japan, there's a tax on beer um, based on the malt content of the beer. And the tax is that there's a certain tax rate up to some percentage malt and then a, a, a higher tax above that. As soon as that tax came into place, the Japanese beer manufacturers introduced new beer uh, brands that were just below the thresholds of this tax. So they had just enough malt but not so much malt that they were kicked into the next higher tax category. In the US, we have, a, have what's called a gas guzzler tax, and that tax is based on the miles per gallon of the car, and it's a notched tax. If the miles per gallon is uh, below a certain threshold, the tax goes up, it, but it goes up in a notched way doesn't go up continuously. And sure enough, in a research I did a few years ago, when that tax was put into place, US cars bunched their uh, miles per gallon, their fuel efficiency to be just on the low tax side of all these notches. Probably more, most, uh, the most important example of this kind of line drawing is debt versus equity financing of corporations, where in most countries, debt is much more favorably treated. Corporations can deduct interest payments on debt, but cannot deduct the implicit return of equity. And so there are uh, many, many securities designed to have characteristics that are just debt-like enough so that they qualify for the tax treatment of debt, uh, but are as equity-like as can be, um, as can still fit into the tax law. And this um, is what you might call tax-induced product innovation, although sometimes the new product is certainly not an improvement, so it might be tax-induced uh, disinnovation. Joe? Uh, yes. Question and uh, some discussion on the chat box. Let me... Uh, mention it here. So some people ask if the government can foresee the effect of tax policy, will it change its strategy? For example, for the window tax, if the government 
expect that people will uh, will uh, make fewer windows as needed. Will the government change the tax policy? Some people uh, provide the answer that uh, okay, but people will change their behavior again when government changes policy. Another yes. audience yes. says uh, the legislative process is slow and usually takes several years. Yes, so um, absolutely. So uh, we would here in the U.S. we'd call that a, a cat and mouse game. So I, I think all taxes are exactly that kind of dynamic process. Uh, the tax comes in place. There are unintended consequences, uh, including a, avoidance and evasion. The government changes the law, and then after a couple of years, and that closes some loopholes. But then. When there's a lot of money at stake, taxpayers discover other loopholes and the government then responds. So there's no question that this is a dynamic process back and forth. Uh, and it's very difficult for the government to anticipate all the responses that taxpayers would have, but um, it should try to anticipate them as much as possible. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, so I also do a lot of research on tax administration. We have a couple chapters on that in the book. We spend a lot of time on um, the way taxes often were collected in the past, but are very rarely collected now, which is called tax farming. And tax farming is that the government would sell or auction off to private individuals or private companies the right to um, collect taxes. So it, Taxes were not collected by a government bureaucracy. They were collected by private citizens or private corporations. And the, um, the problems that caused lead us to a discussion about the uh, bureaucratic organization of, of um, tax administrations and outsourcing of certain tax administration functions. I'm not gonna say much more about that today. Um, other than to tell you that there was a very famous tax farmer. Those of you who took chemistry will know the name of Antoine Lavoisier, who was known as the discoverer of water, but was certainly a prominent figure in the history of uh, chemistry. And he was a tax farmer in France. And unfortunately, he was a tax farmer in France at the time of the French Revolution, when tax collectors were not uh, in particularly good esteem. And uh, when he was arrested for defrauding the state, and he, def he drafted the defense of the tax farmers. Um, and so I asked the question, how did that trial go? And here's the answer. Uh, this is a picture of, I don't think it's supposed to be Lavoisier, but it is somebody at the guillotine in the uh, square in Paris. It did not go well. Uh, we spend a lot of time on another uh, English uh, tax uh, episode, uh, taxing gin. So I talked a little bit about taxing tobacco. Uh, many governments uh, have uh, an assortment of sin taxes, some on smoking, some on alcohol. But the English gin tax episode illustrates an important feature of taxation. Uh, it was started in 1729 and proved very difficult to monitor. And uh, because the tax was originally to be collected from retailers, and there were scores, no, there were hundreds of retailers, and it was just too difficult to monitor. So first they quadrupled the tax rate. And again, it failed in the sense of raising anything near the revenue they hoped. Um, but they changed. Um, Finally, they moved to a successful tax. And what they did was not change the rate. They changed at who, they changed who the tax had to be collected from. They changed it from retailers to host wholesalers. Now, many of you who teach public finance probably teach your students that it doesn't matter uh, who you collect a given tax from, that the, all the implications will be the same. Well, that turns out not to be true when there's tax evasion, and especially, it's, and it's not true when there are administrative costs that depend on the point of collection. So this would be an example, and there are many other, including modern examples of how 
point of collection makes a difference. Um, and the lesson is uh, to the tax administration is when you can get your money from big business. Uh, uh, the last thing I have in the slide is the 85% rule. Um, that's actually an empirical fact. The empirical fact is that in Europe, 85 per, and in the United States, 85% of taxes are collected from businesses. Now that includes taxes that aren't called businesses taxes. So those include employer withholding taxes. So these are taxes nominally on workers, but most of the money is sent in by the employer. So, so if you just count the money that is remitted, sent in by the businesses, it's about 85% in all uh, uh, European countries, the United States, and in the one developing country that I know of, uh, where our study has been done, India, the answer is about 85%. So this seems to be a fact about modern tax collection. Okay, uh, you know who this is, this is Elvis. This is Elvis on a Burkina Faso postage stamp. You might ask, why um, is Elvis on a Burkina Faso postage stamp? Elvis has never been to Burkina Faso, I'm sure. I would guess he had never heard of Burkina Faso, uh, a land, uh, a country in Africa. Most of you, no doubt, know. Well, what is, and what does that have to do with taxation? Well, it has to do with taxation because issuing postage stamps is one way that countries can make money because you have to be a country for stamp collectors to wanna to buy your stamps. Mick and I would like to make money, but if we printed up stamps uh, with Elvis on them, nobody would wanna buy them. We have to be a country. And the, um, issuing stamps that collectors wanna buy is one thing that only countries can do, but there are other things that only countries can do. They can facilitate money laundering and, and here's the connection to tax, they can become tax havens, which are an important issue in international tax these days, as you all know. And it turns out there's a substantial overlap between the countries that put Elvis on their stamps, that is, produce and sell postage stamps just to make money, and those stamps, those countries which are tax havens. Uh, and the general uh, name for this kind of activity is the commercialization of state sovereignty. This is a way that countries can make money because they're countries. Probably the most extreme example of this is the island, uh, Pacific Island country of Tuvalu, which has leased its uh, URL domain of .tv, which uh, lots of people would like to have, and when it did that, when it first released the .tv URL domain, it received an amount issued um, equal to one half of its GDP. Okay, I'm gonna skip ahead because I promised that I would talk about China. So I'm gonna do that now. Okay, um, so in my last 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna give a couple examples uh, from the book about China. I already mentioned the, uh, in, the uh, episode in Hubei province where the tax on cigarettes became such an important part of the revenue of Hubei province that they actually had quotas uh, to people to buy cigarettes so that they could maintain their revenue collections. So I have a few more examples I'd like to tell you about today. So the first is an ingenious land tax in China, and this is on the order of 3,000 years ago. So back in 3,000 years ago, most all taxes came from taxing agriculture or land. Why? Because most, of, most all the income and the wealth came from agriculture and land. So in the Zhao dynasty about 3,000 years ago, there was a, I think an ingenious system of dividing land into equal sized three by three parcels. So uh, envision uh, a grid of nine squares um, where the out, outer eight were owned by uh, individual, individual farmers, but the center square uh, 
was collectively farmed. Everybody had to pitch in and the produce from the central square was the tax. Uh, uh, certainly many of the things one would do to make the eight private squares productive would also make the central square productive. Now, I'm gonna say something which you can, all of you on this call will know right away whether it's still true, but I learned uh, from the uh, uh, from the guide to the Beijing Tax Museum, which I'm sure all of you have been to at least once, that the composition of the pictographic character for tax has always been made up of the characters for crop and exchange. And this system from 3,000 years ago, this ingenious tax system, was known as the well field system. And the character for well which I show here on the slide, conveys its essence visually because it shows the nine uh, grid where the middle would be the tax, the produce from the middle uh, part of the field is the tax. Okay, I think that's example one from China. Example two, it's a little bit more recently. This is um, uh, eight year uh, in the 800s, so about, 1200 years ago, 1200 years ago, salt taxes were a very important part of revenue. In fact, they were more than half of China's revenues, including helping paying for additions to the Great Wall. But as you know, and as I've talked about this morning, anything that is taxed is liable to be smuggled. And on the next slide is a map, a picture of a map sent in 1780 uh, to the King Emperor by the governors of Yunnan. Why? Well, the governors wanted to, the emperor to know that their tax revenue was being eroded by the smuggling of salt through mountain passes from neighboring Sichuan and was asking for help in uh, monitoring and enforcing the salt tax system. And there it is. And I confess, I cannot uh, read these characters, but uh, I saw this um, in a museum and I am told that this is a map of salt smuggling routes uh, from Sichuan to Yunnan. Uh, anyone can translate that for me, please send me an email. Okay, two more. Um, This is also an example from China when uh, as early as the year 486, tax exemptions were provided uh, to Buddhists. And it turned out as is true for maybe every tax there ever was, when there's a tax, some people will uh, uh, change their behavior uh, to reduce their taxation. And in this case, the behavior that had to be change is that you had to become a Buddhist priest. And uh, as early as the year 486, this, uh, historians say people were assuming the title entered into religion as a form of tax evasion. And as yet another example of the back and forth between taxpayers and tax uh, administrators, the emperor at the time or in the year 629 ordered that monks that who were illegally ordained for the purpose of tax evasion were to be executed. And that wasn't enough because in the year 830, it is said about 300,000 people who were apparently, who were nominally monks and nuns were found to have false ordination certificates. And some of those that weren't false had simply been purchased. Several, uh, we have uh, a lot in the uh, book about tax technology and technology has been put to use both by administrators trying to collect their tax in a verifiable way. And it's been put to use by would-be avoiders and evaders. And we have uh, examples from history of both. And I'll end, uh, I'll talk in a second about one from the Beijing Tax Museum. 
So in Egypt, in the time of uh, uh, Ptolemy, uh, there was a technology that tracked the height of the Nile River in flood. Why was that technology employed by the government and what did that have to do with tax? Well, back in the day, uh, the taxes were based on agricultural produce and critical to the agri to the um, how good the harvest in Egypt was, was how high the Nile River was. And so this technology determined, tracked the height of the Nile, which determined how good the harvest would be, which in turn was used to set tax rates. So that's an example from thousands of years ago of tax technology. But just a few years ago in Argentina, the Buenos Aires Provincial Tax Agency used drones. Why? To identify uh, uh, mansions and indeed swimming pools that had not been declared for property tax purposes. Makes a lot of sense. Send up a drone, take pictures, and compare that, compare those pictures to the property tax register. And uh, if uh, the drone takes a picture of a mansion and it's not on the register, you get a call and say, explain why you didn't haven't declared that property. In Italy, um, they did a, a, a very similar program. Uh, zappers um, are another technology. This one used uh, by would-be tax evaders. What a zapper is, it's a piece of software you can put it, um, if you're a retailer, you put it, uh, you install the Zapper software into your cash register. And what it does is that it randomly deletes some sales. Well, you can see why if you're a would-be tax evader, this could come in handy because when the income tax inspector comes or the sales tax inspector comes and they say, we want to know your sales, can we want to see the, um, you know, the, uh, program that uh, keeps all your sales. We want to see the computer record of your sales. And you say, no program, no problem. You hand it over, but the zapper has randomly deleted some sales. So zappers are a tax um, evasion technology. And in response, some European countries now require that retailers only use certified cash registers, certified um, that are in a way that makes them zapper proof. A diesel fuel in the United States, diesel fuel is taxed depending on what it's going to be used for, but it's taxed at the, it's uh, up, up um, stream, so at the refinery level. But at the refinery level, you don't know uh, what it's going to be used for. So somebody had the clever idea of uh, dyeing uh, diesel fuel depending on whether um, uh, the uh, use was tax exempt or not. And so it meant that uh, if a tax person pulls over a truck and looks into their fuel tank, and they don't have the uh, right kind of fuel uh, dye wise, they are uh, guilty of tax evasion. What's the technology? The technology is that there are plants around the world that will undye fuel so that you can. Um, Get them, get the fuel at the low tax rate, and not be susceptible to that kind of tax enforcement. But perhaps uh, in the Mick, in my view, the most exquisite example of tax technology is found. I don't know how far away from where you all are now, but for some of you, it's just down the street at the Beijing Tax Museum, and this is what it looks like. Uh, I'm guessing those of you who haven't been to the museum. Don't know what this is, um, and so I'm going to explain what this is. But you can see that these are um, cylindrical uh, pieces of uh, bamboo that have characters on them, and they're known as G. I'm pronouncing them correctly. And these G were cast in 323 BC, so this is 2,300 years ago, and. Uh, it's related to tax because they were used to enforce a tax exemption granted for the river's transportation of specified goods. So some goods traveling by river uh, 
were subject to tax and others were exempt. So in order to inf um, inf have the exemption, but to limit the exemption to the specified goods, the G consisted of two halves, um, each with gold and silver inlaid in bronze. So that's what you're seeing up here, okay? Gold and silver inlaid in bronze. I think I might have said bamboo. One half of these was carried with the ships, and the other half was held by the customs authorities. So if you're a ship driver, you're coming down the river and you stop at the customs uh, um, authority, you pull out one half of the G and you see if it matches what the custom authority has. And if it matches, that means that in fact, you have been granted the right to transport um, these particular, this particular cargo on this particular route and you could pass untaxed. So I'll show it to you one more time because it's an example, I think, of clever tax technology from two, over 2000 years ago and beautiful tax technology. Okay, so my last example is from China and it's about uh, tax administrators. So we, in the book, we tell stories of tax administration. Some famous people um, uh, have been tax administrators. I have a list here. You might be surprised to see Adam Smith on the list, maybe less so for some of the others. Uh, but the story having to do with China is about an Irishman named Robert Hart. Robert Hart ran the Chinese tax system for almost 50, 50 years, from 1863 to 1911. So successful was he at running the Chinese tax system that by 1911, he was running not only the tax system, but many other administrative agencies. And so competent and revered was he, that he was awarded many, many things, including the ancestral rank of the first class of the first order for three generations. So revered was Robert Hart that he was honored with a statue in Shanghai, which I'm gonna show you in a second. And also uh, not so um, exciting, there was a recent novel about his love life, but let's put that aside. And the point we make in the book is that successful tax administration is important for successful government and a successful civil society. And the administration has to be run by people and tax administrators are often the unsung heroes of public finance. And I wanna close by showing you the statue. This is the statue of Robert Hart in um, the Bund in Shanghai. It is no longer there. It was taken down, I believe in the 1940s, but it stood for uh, a while. And that's Robert Hart. And as far as I know, it's the only statue of a tax administrator that has been up anywhere in the world at any time. Okay, so I think I'm about uh, uh, on promise time. Thank you for your attention. The book is due to be published uh, in April. If you have any corrections to what I said or have, especially if you have any episodes of taxation fa fascinating and or instructive, please send it along.